King's Speech will take place tomorrow. At the heart of it will be legislation to create Great British Energy, which is uh, part of the new government's plans to make the UK a clean energy superpower. Now, Labour has an ambitious target of 100% of UK electricity production to be generated by renewables by 2030. The Tories had a, a target time of 2035. Now, one of the key obstacles to meeting the 2030 target is the challenge of upgrading the UK's electricity grid network. Let's talk to Dr Shuganda Shrivastav of Oxford University's Smith School of Enterprise and Environment. Welcome to you. Um, just briefly, what is the grid and why do we need to expand it? Well, the grid is a very important piece of infrastructure because it's what helps electrons go from where they're generated to households and businesses. And one of the reasons we need to expand it is because a lot of renewable energy is located in the north. Think of your Scottish offshore wind farms. And a lot of where electricity is consumed is down south. So we need to expand the grid and ease up congestion along one of those main north to south transmission lines. Do we know how much in a sort of ballpark figure it will cost? Well, there's different cost estimates, but let me lay out the thinking here. There's three ways we can approach this problem. One is we can build out more transmission. Two, we can build more grid scale batteries to store renewable electricity. And three, we can also move demand um, because if consumers can move demand from peak times to off peak, then that actually reduces the pressure to build these pylons. So in terms of what the total cost estimate is, it really depends on the strategy of how we balance across these three options. But are the plans achievable? Yes, I think the plans are achievable. If we look at the past, from 2012, the UK had 38% of coal on its grid, and eight years later, that went down to 2%. So rapid transformation is absolutely possible and has already been done by this country. So I think that from a technical perspective, this is doable. We'll need to get the politics right. Ah, right. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the political aspect of it, um, Shaganda. Is the government likely to face significant political opposition to these plans in whatever form they take? Well, I think getting the messaging correct is absolutely key. So after Russia invaded Ukraine, gas prices went through the roof, and that resulted in unprecedented increases in household electricity bills. Now, it is a fact that solar and wind provide the cheapest electricity in the UK, and this can really help affordability. So there is a moment to capitalize on this narrative and to say that building transmission and battery storage is all part of bringing the cheapest electricity to households. It's absolutely critical that we nail this narrative because it is the narrative that is backed by the data. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shrivastav, uh, for joining us. How are you going to achieve it? Listening to what you just heard um, Shuganda say, how are you going to achieve it by 2030? Right, so look, this is the start. Great British Energy is about creating competition into the grid. This is about cheap, homegrown renewables. At the moment, you cannot get a space on the grid for 15 years. The government have got a backlog of new technologies, of different ways. You know, we've already lifted the ban on onshore wind. That's the very first thing that we have done. Mm. So this is something we don't have a choice. We have to do it if we want to bring bills down. We want to have energy security and we will create good jobs by doing this. Yes, um, and, and this is all the campaign uh, stuff that we heard. But just to be clear to our viewers, Preet, it is going to involve something like a thousand miles of power lines and pylons. This was actually to get there by 2035, so I mean, you're going to have to uh, speed it up. Or 400 miles of undersea cables. The National Grid's um, electricity systems operator said it would be at a cost of £60 billion to upgrade uh, to electricity being totally renewable by 2030. How's that going to happen? Look, first thing is that you've got to have planning um, proposals put in place. And so pe there will be the normal consultation. This is not going to be something we force on uh, anybody, especially farmers, for example. This will have to be done with consent. And as you say, there is underground cabling. We've got to look at the cost factor of that as a, you know, and mm. pylons. But this essentially is about how do we get the electricity to businesses and into homes. This is a big challenge. We've had conservatives that have done nothing. We've been reliant on foreign dictators for our energy security and we need to make a shift and transition to that. Henry?
I mean, the reason the Conservatives have done nothing is because they have refused time and again to force people to build stuff they don't want to do, which is exactly what you're saying you'll do now. Ultimately, the problem with our planning system is that it is riddled with local vetoes, and local people often have very different cost-benefit analyses to the country. The test for essential infrastructure, of which pylons is part, should not be whether local people want it, it should be whether the nation needs it, and central government should have the will to drive it through. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're not going to deliver anything like the amount of cabling required. We will deliver that, but of course we've but got to explain to the British public why we need to do it. Unfortunately, previously, people haven't just really understood how the grid works, why our ga you know, uh, electricity you and gas is so expensive. No. Look, look, absolutely, you, you're talking about need. We have got to do this. We do not have a choice in the matter, especially when we think about climate. Um, you know, the, the, the Greens have, the co-leader of the Greens has been uh, objecting to a lot mm. of these renewable projects, where nobody knows actually what the Greens actually support, to be honest. But yes, we will. We, there is a clear plan and strategy that Ed Miliband has together right. about how we achieve this. Right. Well, well, Carla, you say that isn't quite true. It is true. So one of the people that Henry is talking about when he says that local people have a different view, one of those local people is uh, your new Green MP, Adrian Ramsey. He's called for a pause in terms of building power lines that would go through his constituency. Now, you're the Green Party. If there was ever not in my backyard, that's it. It is absolutely in the DNA of the Greens to push for a more rapid rollout of renewables. That is literally... Including pylons and power lines across his constituency. My co-leader, Adrian, newly elected, yeah. hard-working MP, has <laughs> rightly been making sure that the people in his constituency have a chance to have their voice heard in the ongoing public consultation. So has he failed to communicate that's, the that's, message possibly at a Green MP? Right. But both he and I have previously worked in the renewable energy sector. Mm. In my case, I've literally gone into politics because yes. I used to work in offshore wind and I saw that the barrier to the rapid rollout isn't the technology, as we've, as we've just heard mm. from the expert there, it's the political will. And on the grid specifically, Specifically, if I may, I would argue that part of the reason that the grid hasn't been invested in and built out earlier, because really the time this needed to happen was decades ago, not now, is in part because the national grid is privatised. And so they didn't have that public mandate to invest in the system decades ahead before... Right. Because we've now got renewable so you're energy going to object. So to you're wait. going to object to it now, even though a pylon in this constituency, no, and Adrian I... Ramsey, hang on, constituency in particular, is going to carry that electricity from the offshore wind to parts of I, the country I, that's needed. I have to pick up on what you said there. Adrian Ramsey is not opposing all pylons and the Green Party. In I no didn't say all. Party. I said the one in his constituency. <laughs> so, there's so, so much exactly. more where pylons a, can go. A, so, to <laughs> clarify, my colleague Adrian is challenging particular yeah, aspects of in the his route constituency. and suggesting that, may I just finish, that parts of the route should be undergrounded in ecologically ah, sensitive how areas. How much is that going to which cost? Which the National Grid has already done in some areas mm. in response to first rounds of the feedback and he's helping constituents to have their voices heard on the impacts on the local area, which yeah, I think is, I think is what is every... five times as much. Yeah, I've read ten times, and but so look, well, you know... for certain parts of the route, even if it's not the whole thing, I think is worth considering. Right, OK, well, maybe it is worth considering. Uh, Luke, you support, I presume, uh, the plans by the Labour government, the ambition of it, and their commitment to saying no. Well, I've, I've got an insight into this, having spent um, the PPS in Bayes and then in Energy and Net Zero. So mm. I've heard these debates go on, and it's very interesting. I think both Labour and the Greens are going to get a rude awakening mm. when they are put there but as MPs to well. say, would you have solar panels in, you know, Edgebaston Golf Club, for example, where uh, I, I trained. It's very hard then for, the, for you to turn around to your public and say, well, it's for the greater good. There has to be a balance on this, and th that's why I'm quite excited to see what comes forward. We put forward the, uh, the, the energy security bill that has now gone into place, but yeah. I'm quite keen to see what GB Energy actually looks like and what a wealth fund actually looks like, because we're still not really clear. Does it make any energy? How, what's the risk profile on this wealth fund that's going to be there? I Who's think going you to carry to the you, can? You ought to read the briefings, in uh, all honesty. But the, this idea well, that somehow in, in Birmingham and Edgbaston they wouldn't it? expect a solar panel, say, on a green field, that is incorrect, because most people understand that they want their bills to come down, yeah. they want energy security, and we have to they look do, at but also green they spaces where you can the do dual things. The argument made by the co-leader of the Greens in his local part is about what about food security, what about the rural environment, what about the traffic, what about the community? This is the difficult part, but and Luke, government is to make a choice. And Henry's right here. These are really, really difficult issues to try mm. and work and out. And ones that the, the Conservatives failed to actually grapple with um, because well, of hear, vested interests. Hang on, you did hear from um, uh, Ashuganda. Uh, 
Yeah. He's saying that actually we've managed to make a significant change over the last eight years. We oh. are the fastest, de uh, fastest decarbonising side, but uh, country in the in the world. Um, but the infrastructure side is fundamental. And we've just been talking about defence yes. and wanting to spend more there, but trying to argue Luke, uh, no, ten goodness, years ago about... you had about no the... idea how to do this. The National Wealth Fund we've that we are talking about reviews. is one pound of investment. We will want three pounds back So what's back the risk profile the for it? When the sector. Sector. Are we seeing There's another... been no stability for businesses so, uh, to bring is this in investment. P talk to each other. Don't talk over each other if it's you can. A, I'm really keen to see. So it's not a wealth fund in the sense of what Norway have set out, but what's the risk profile to the taxpayer? How much do they expect to get up? Because from what I gather it's supposed to be an investment on the riskier part so how much of a hit and you've put it out to a quango right. it's not the minister himself Come on. Going to well there are lots of questions there. but the broad question um if you don't mind oh, me um, <laughs> summarizing is bills will have to go up won't they in the short term to pay for this and then bills might come down in 10 years time no i don't i look well, you don't think well, bills the, will have the, to go the, up at all no Nas the national wealth fund is about it you know we will invest a pound right. and we will ask three pound investment from private sector why is that important the private sector hasn't had the stability it needs from this government from the last government uh, in order to bring about the investment so how do we get it's our ports renewable UK ready how do we invest in hydrogen soon. how do we have the gigafactories right. that labor labor has already made commitments to how do we invest in the steel industry these are all really important investment projects decarbonizing those industrial hubs well this is exactly what's needed I yeah. mean, none of well this it may be what's needed but it is about whether or not you will be able to drive through opposition the sort of opposition that we've been talking about I mean just Especially broadly Carl, given that Labour have rolled back on their investment pledge I mean let's not forget this oh. is the party who rolled back on their 28 billion mm. climate investment pledge but you'd still and be well, opposing Carla, some you, infrastructure Carla, is objecting to pylons in his constituency. I mean, goodness me, what, my, we, what my... we have is a very clear plan about how do we get energy security. At the moment, we are reliant on foreign dictators. The government sold off gas storage. And at the moment, we're paying 62 million a day because the grid can't actually cope with capacity. This is dire. So actually, what we are going to do will address a lot of these issues. And, and, I... and I'm interested to see what happens with Great British Energy. It could be a really... <laughs> important part of the solution. But if you're going to massively cut investment in climate action, which is what the Labour Party did before it even got into power, how are you going to fund that? The thing, you know, the, the 28 billion that was your policy was already the floor of what was needed. And we know that the sooner we invest mm. in reducing carbon emissions, the cheaper it is for government. The mm. later we leave it, the more it costs. If Labour's really serious about this, it should make GB Energy a planning authority with the power to give itself planning permission. Uh, that would allow it to deliver everything it wanted and take all of the politicians and their local concerns out of the equation. I don't think it is clear because you started the spiel for Great British Energy saying it wasn't something you were going to force mm. on people and then within two minutes was saying that you were. And it's important that you do. Uh, mm. We really do need to force infrastructure through. I think the easiest thing for politicians to do normally is just to try and build stuff in the bits of the country that vote for other people. You know, it's absolutely extraordinary that the Conservatives didn't manage to build Abingdon Reservoir. Large parts of the southwest have avoidable drought. But the problem is always planning. The private sector has been oh, trying to build Abingdon. Yeah. It has been trying to build a lot of projects. You can't bring forward that investment unless you offer them security of planning. And you cannot offer security of planning if you have an extended process with a local veto where a single project can fall at any point of an expensive multi-year pitch process. Right, but so Henry, you do offer you those guarantees, it won't happen. But Henry, do you think uh, Dr Shuganda is right that because of the experience of spiking uh, energy prices and therefore people's bills, that might soften up some opposition to having the sorts of infrastructure that we've been talking about. I mean, it might, and that would be wonderful, but just historically it hasn't. Mm. We've tried uh, energy development projects, pylons, have tried offering local people lower bills as part of an incentive process mm. for approval, mm. and it has never worked. Sadly, the fact is, it, it, if you can get people to agree to it, it's ideal. And there are things you can do. You could try and make the pylons you know, prettier, they're hideous. You could try and make them part of the landscape in, a, in more way. But ultimately, you need to have the will as central government to say this, the nation needs this, and we are going to do it, even that, if that leaves... Well, can I with you on that? Right. I mean, the final point I would make, the cross-government working will ensure that, because, of course, it's different departments working together to understand why this is important and why it's important in certain areas and being able to then communicate that, and that's exactly what will happen. Keir's right. very clear that that's how he's going to drive a lot of the missions is those cross-government departments. Well, let's just pick up on something that you were asked, uh, Carla, during the election campaign in terms of leading from the front. Um, here's the Times headline. Yes, I have a gas boiler, 
but I plan to replace it, says Green's co-leader. Carla Denyer said she was getting quotes for a heat pump but had to delay the installation until after the election. Have you accepted any of the yes, quotes that are right. in your inbox? Um, I'm, I haven't been back in Bristol a great deal over the last few days, but yes, right. I've, I have now got a couple of quotes for an installation of a heat pump. Looking forward to finding some time to get that done, perhaps in the recess. Right. We'll come back to it when you're next uh, on the programme.